Good. It's been a long day. I hope you guys have learned a lot about careers uh, opportunities that are out there. My name is Scott Correa, and I am the youth team leader at the Pikes Peak Workforce Center here in Colorado Springs. Who here has heard of the Pikes Peak Workforce Center? I've heard of Workforce. you heard of Workforce, okay. A couple hands, that's good. All right. Um, well, the Pikes Peak Workforce Center provides job seekers in the Pikes Peak region, so that would be in El Paso and Teller counties, with employment and educational uh, resources. Uh, I know that this is being streamed around the state, so I also want to say that there's workforce centers located throughout the state, and I encourage you to locate or to find the, the workforce center nearest to you. So. So the Pikes Peak Workforce Center, as I said, offers education and employment services to all job seekers. Within the Workforce Center, we have what we call the Youth Zone. And the Youth Zone provides those same resources for young adults ages 14 to 21. And those are general services like job search assistance, job readiness training. That can look like uh, resume writing, help, help with writing a resume. Um, mock interviews, if you've never interviewed for a job before, being able to do practice interviews, and those types of things. Then, within the youth program, we have what we call the WIA Youth Program, and that's what I'm here to tell you a little bit more about today. So what is the WIA Youth Program? WIA is short for Workforce Investment Act. It is a federally funded program designed sorry, to assist... Workforce Invest... Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, is a federally funded program designed to assist young people ages 17 to 21. So a little different, little older youth, uh, years of age who have one or more of the following barriers to employment or education. And when we're talking about a barrier to education or employment, we're talking about something that might be preventing you from, uh, you know, finding gainful employment or being able to uh, go to the school that you want to go to. So. Uh, those barriers include deficiency in basic literacy and numeracy. means that you're reading or doing math at below a ninth grade level. But it's my understanding that most of this group is kind of college bound. So I'm really happy to hear that. Uh, we also serve high school dropouts, homeless and runaway youth, pregnant and parenting youth, youth who are transitioning back into the community from uh, juvenile detention facilities. So they would be youthful offenders youth in foster care, and finally that last one, youth who just need additional assistance with achieving their career goals. So that's just about everybody in here. Okay, but what does that mean? Uh, participants enrolled in this program can take advantage of 10 core services, and these services are job search assistance, which we already kind of touched on. Um, it's good to have a job search strategy when you're out there looking for employment. Uh, it's not enough just to go online to Monster or to any of the other job search sites and look that way. You really be, need to be doing that, but in addition to that, you need to be networking, you need to be going door to door to businesses. There's all sorts of ways to uh, look for work these days, and we want to uh, uh, make you aware of those. Paid internships. This usually gets everybody's ears to perk up just a bit when I say paid because you're getting paid for, these, uh, for this work experience. One of the things we hear from young people all the time is, I can't get a job because I don't have any experience. But I can't get any experience and no one gives me a job. Well, that is what these, that, that is what these opportunity internships are about. We are able to place you with an employer for a predetermined amount of time. Most of the time, these internships are about three to four months in length and they run anywhere from 15, 20, all the way up to 30 hours a week. Um, so you're able to gain valuable work experience uh, while working, getting paid, and at the end of the internship, for about 20% of the youth in these internships, there's an offer of permanent employment at the end of the internship. But even if there's not an offer of permanent employment at the end of the internship, now you have something to put on your resume. Now you can say, I have that experience that employers are looking for. Uh, help paying for school. Uh, again, I know a lot of you are, are college bound, looking at post-secondary education or training, and we want to be able to help out with that. School's expensive, no doubt, but things like paying for books or, or other things like that, we can help out with. Uh, tutoring, GED preparation, 
Probably none of you need that. All of you are going to be graduating from high school very soon. Uh, supportive services. Supportive serv services are things like transportation assistance. Um, you know, that's another one of the things that we hear from young people all the time is, you know, I have trouble getting around. I don't have a driver's license. I have to use the bus. We can provide you with transportation assistance. That might be a 31-day bus pass so you can get to and from work or to and from school. Uh, other supportive services include things like interview, what we call interview appropriate attire. Uh, for the young men, that's, you know, a dress shirt, maybe a tie, dress pants, dress shoes. For the young women, that might be, you know, dress slacks and blouse, skirts, dresses, those types of things. So you look professional when you go on that job interview. Well, you looked so good at that job interview that they hired you, got a job. Now they're saying that you need certain kind of shoes, maybe a uniform, work pants, work clothes, maybe a set, certain set of tools. We can help pay for that as well. So those are just an example of the supportive services we provide. Leadership activities. Uh, we like to get all of the youth enrolled in our program involved in the community because I think that's where leadership starts. So we have volunteer opportunities in the community. Recently, we took a young people, a group of young people down to the St. Patrick's Day Parade uh, to volunteer. We've taken volunteers out for Special Olympics events. And then we have just or leadership workshops where we really help you to identify what are those qualities of a leader, what are the qualities of a leader, and you know, which of those qualities you have and how you can use them to your advantage. Referrals to community resources. Um, Young people tell us all the time that, or, or young people are unaware of all the resources uh, that are available to them in the community. Whether that's assistance, you know, paying a utility bill, or maybe with food and groceries, you know, maybe, maybe things are tough right now and you just need to talk to a counselor or somebody like that. We can make those types of referrals for you. And finally, follow-up services. Uh, once you achieve your education and employment goals, we don't just say, we don't, we don't just kick you out the door and say, good luck. We continue to follow up with you for up to a year after you exit the program to make sure that you're still on track, that you're still successful, that you're still working, that you're still going to school, that you're doing those things that are going to help you to, you know, become the, the person that you want to become. So. Anything else? Well, there's always more. Question. No. Uh, if, say, after that year that you stop following up, you lose your job for one reason or another, are you able to rejoin the program? Um, you can. Re uh, the question was that um, if after your year of follow-up, if you lost your job or something like that happened, whether you'd be able to be re-enrolled in the program. Um, you are able to be re-enrolled in the program. Maybe by that time you've already turned 21 and you would be eligible for adult services. As I said, the Workforce Center provides uh, services for both young people as well as, as adults. So, but yeah, I think, um, you know, the workforce is always there no matter what your age is. So that's a very good question. So, and again, going back to the eligibility, if you are in school, you must be within 12 months of graduating or completing your course of study. So that means any of you who are uh, currently juniors, maybe in the second semester of your junior year, would be eligible for this program. Um, you must commit to working with your workforce development specialist to develop what we call an individual service strategy that will serve as your roadmap to the su success. And an individual service strategy is just that. It's your, it's your strategy. We're not here to tell you, you need to go to school and you need to study this. Or you need to just find a job and you need to earn this. We're listening to you. What do you want to achieve? Where do you want to take your life? Then we want to be able to help support you and get you to where you want to go. The bottom line, the bottom line is you're going to get out of this program what you put into it. We are ready to invest in your future success. The question is, are you? So with that, I have time to take a few questions. Are there any other questions? What was the name of the WIA? What was that 
The WIA is Workforce Investment Act. The question was, what is WIA? A question here, Alyssa? Do you have any information that we can take this up? Uh, I do. Uh, I believe that after you're through here and the next presentation, that you'll be heading over to, is it Argo? Uh-huh. No. I, I my, I our group, my group's staying here and presenters are going between the two. Okay, so they won't be visiting the, the career area. Um, then what I will do, Alyssa, is I will make sure that I bring over some materials um, so you have information on the program that way. Anyone else back here in the back row? We recently um, spoke to a financial aid, a professional financial aid consultant. Uh-huh. Who suggested kids start preparing for their college, making their plan, I guess, as early as ninth grade. Does the workforce have any accessibility for kids that young? Well, as I said, we have general services available for youth um, ages 14 and up. Uh, one, of the work, one of the workshops that those younger youth can come to, those 14, 15 year olds, we have what we call cash for class, which is a financial aid 101. So it kind of walks through what the financial process is in terms of filling out the FAFSA, which is the federal application for assistance. Is for, for FAFSA, Federal Application for there's a, Student Aid, there we go, SA, I forgot the SA, so the FAFSA. Um, and then also, uh, in addition to that, making them aware of the scholarships that are out there, that, you know, the other monies that are out there. We, we do touch upon student loans, very, you know, cautioning students that this is money that will be paid back. Uh, but the process for us is generally to have the youth fill out the FAFSA, receive their award letter, see what they are getting, if anything, and then basing our tuition assistance on, uh, on that. So that's a very good question. Thank you. All right. Well, if there aren't any other questions, I'm going to turn it over to the uh, next gentleman, uh, or the next presenter, who will be talking about um, probably something that will be of great interest to you, and that is starting your own business and entrepreneurship. So thank you for your time and attention. to give you the mic. You can put it in your pocket or whatever.
Can't forget to get wired up. <laughs> Where was I? Starting your own business. So Scott has told you a little bit about what the Workforce Center can do if you're interested in going into the workplace and working for someone else. How many of you think you might be interested in starting your own business someday? So I see several hands going up. More hands going up. That's good. So the question we want to talk about a little today is, what does it take to start your own business? What do you think is required to start your own business? Money. Money? Yeah. A place to start it. <laughs> Probably a location, depending on what kind of business you've got. What else, Patrick? Certification as well. Yes, depending on what kind of uh, service you're going to be doing or what kind of product you're going to be providing. It might require certain kinds of licenses or professional certifications for you to be able to do those kinds of things. That's true. What else? A business plan. And that's what we're here to help with. That's SCORE. That's a big part of what we do is help you to put your business plan together. So how many of you have heard business plan or have an idea of what a business plan is? What kind of stuff is going to go into your business plan? I would guess maybe how you plan to fund it or find investors or whatever. Okay, financing is going to be an important part. So let me kind of play off of that idea. In order for you to figure out what you need in the way of financing, what has to happen first? Mm, no, before that. Yeah, how much money you're going to need? What kind of business are you going to start? Is it going to require a building? Is it going to require equipment? Um, is it something that you can start from home? So what kind of startup costs are you going to have? And before you can figure out how much money you need and where you're going to go find it, you've got to figure out what are the financials. So financial analysis. Yes, sir. Uh, also, it would probably depend on your location. Like if you're opening it here in Colorado Springs versus opening in L.A., mm. California, mm -hmm. the cost might be more than likely. So what is your location? Uh, what kinds of things will affect the cost of starting a business in Colorado Springs versus Los Angeles? What's the most obvious one? Cost of living or the cost of real estate? You know, how much do you have to pay for a building on a square foot basis in Colorado Springs versus LA? What other kinds of things would come into play? Where you are, basically. You might want to open a store in L.A., but you're in Colorado Springs. Yeah. It's hard. It might be difficult to run a business in Los Angeles if you live in Colorado Springs. But depending on what kind of business you have, it might be more advantageous to have a business based in L.A. than it would to be have a business based in Colorado. So again, that goes back to some very basic kinds of questions. What is it that you're in business to do? Now, I use this example um, with one of the earlier groups I talked to. It seems like a silly idea, but it, uh, it helps illustrate the point. If you get a pet, what's the first thing that you do when you bring your pet home? Get food? Maybe. Food. Food, water, yes. In the front row here? Name it. A name. There you go. Don't you want to have a name for your business? <laughs> it's simple, isn't it? <laughs> but it's something you have to think about. Why, why are names important? That place? Yeah, let's say, for example, I'll just use this as an illustration. What if you wanted to start up a restaurant to sell hamburgers, and you said, I'm going to name my restaurant McDonald's? <coughs> That's already named. 
That name's already been used, hasn't it? It's already trademarked and copyrighted, and if you dare to try to open a restaurant called McDonald's, you can bet that McDonald's lawyers are going to be on you like glue. So considering what else is out there, and, and usually picking something that's descriptive. There was an example we talked about earlier today about a young lady who wanted to start a pet care business, actually a dog washing business. So if you start, wanted to start a dog washing business, a descriptive name would be? In, in this case, it w her, her name was Morgan, and she said, I was going to call it Morgan's Dog Wash. Okay. What does that tell me? It tells me what your name is, and it tells me what your business is. So it's a good descriptive kind of name. So just things as simple as naming your business. And this gets into a more technical aspect of starting a business, but there's something called business entities. Now, a business is treated as a separate entity. And there are different ways to organize your business. And the ways that you organize your business are often based on who owns it. So oftentimes, it's going to be a business with a single owner. So you could have a sole proprietorship. In fact, kind of by default, everybody has a sole proprietorship. But there are other kinds of legal structures that might make sense depending on what kind of business you want to start, especially if you want to have more than one owner. So you might have a partnership. So you might see, for example, a law practice where there are partners who own the law practice or doctors who own a, a medical practice. So legal structure is something that we think about. And again, it goes back to the business plan. What is it that you want to go in business to do? How are you going to set up the ownership? How are you going to get the funding that you need to start the business? Where are you going to locate the business? Now, why is, why is location important? Yeah. Alyssa? Because you don't want to put it in the middle of the desert where you're not going to have any customers. <laughs> right. So you want to think about where your customers are going to be. So that goes back to another basic question. Who is going to buy what you want to sell? The customers. Which customers? Because there are lots of them out there. So if you're in the dog wash business, what kind of customers are you looking for? Dog <laughs> People who own dogs. That's probably a good way to go, yes. So location can be very important. All right, we just have a few minutes left, so let me uh, open the floor here if you have any questions that I can answer for you. I do have some brochures to hand out. So I'll go ahead and start passing those around the room. Does anybody have any questions? Melissa. A lot of college what? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Not necessarily. Um, that's a good question because the skills that are required to run a business are kind of a unique set of skills. Most people, and that includes college graduates, have a very specialized field of study. Okay. Just because you're very good at one thing doesn't mean you're going to be really good at running a business. So part of what we do at SCORE is help teach you the kinds of things that you need to know in addition to your particular skill to be able to run your business successfully. Some of the most successful business people, though, didn't go to college. Uh, like Bill Gates. Michael Dell dropped out of college. Yeah. Sometimes. Oh, oh, Ray Kroc. I don't know if he went to college or not. Ray Kroc. Ray Kroc. I believe that was back in the 50s. I think he's probably long gone by now. But McDonald's lives on. All right, any other questions? Yes. SCORE services are, uh, when we do mentoring one-on-one -on -one with clients, those are free services. The workshops that we offer, there's a cost associated. And also, by going to our website, um, well, let's see. If you go to, well, they've changed the links a little bit. 
Um, probably this link that says run and grow a business. There are a lot of online resources that are available, templates, articles, um, webinars, and those kinds of things. So um, I think just about everything that's available through our website is free. So, all right, well, thank you very much.